Good afternoon, Lake Erie Council. We are out in the field live today for our Bear Den meeting. I'm Jared Blundy, your uh, Firelands Camp Director, and I'm here with my special guest. Hey, Peggy. Hey, Jared. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's nice to be outside on this wonderful Earth Day. It's a little bit yep. chillier than it was this morning, but that's okay. It's still a nice yeah. day. It's Northeast Ohio. If you don't like the weather, give it 10 minutes. Exactly. Well, the reason we're outside today is because today's Bear Den meeting is all about going fishing. We're doing the Bear Goes Fishing Adventure. And Peggy here is our resident expert on uh, all things nature, but particularly fishing. She's very excited to teach us today about uh, regulations, different kinds of fish anatomy, the fish we'll see in our area. And then we're going to finish up today with an actual demonstration of uh, fishing with my cold gear. Am that right? Yep. We're going to have fun. Fantastic. Uh, so if anybody's joining us live on Facebook, we also have our, our uh, producer, Anthony, in the background, keeping an eye on our comments and questions. We'd love to hear uh, how you are uh, spending your Earth Day. And if you have questions on uh, the fish we're talking about or casting technique or any of that stuff, just throw in the comments and we'll try and answer that live. Also in the uh, video description of our then mean today you'll find some links to some coloring pages. And that's what we're doing here to get started. Uh, I've got three different fish here. Uh, which happen to be three fish in our area. Isn't that right, Peggy? Yeah. Uh, there, what there do we got three, here? There are three fish that like to live in our lakes and our streams and our ponds. Awesome. I think I've got the yellow perch here. So I'm going to try and color mine, and you can tell me if I've got my colors right or not. What else okay. do we have going on? Uh, all sorts of things, but I've gone blank. <laughs> but me on uh, let's see, the catfish, is that right? Yes, and there's the catfish. Uh, lots of people love to get cat, catch catfish. Do you know what the best time to catch catfish is? Hmm. Well, I've always heard that fishing in the morning is the best kind of fishing, but I don't know if that's true for catfish or not. Maybe they're night owls or night fish. <laughs> so the best time to get cat, catch catfish is at dawn or at dusk. Oh, they like the sunset and the sunrise? Yep. You know there's a special word for animals that... Uh, eat at dawn and at dusk. I didn't, what is that? Crepuscular. Crepuscular, that's a fun word. It is a fun word. It means at the edges, this is the day and the edges of the night. And there's a lot of animals out there that are crepuscular. Interesting. Uh, I know that at uh, Firelands we have really, really big catfish over in the Camp Abraham Pond. So if you're uh, visiting us this summer out at uh, camp, Sounds like uh, the morning and the evening is your best chance to catch those giant fish. Yep. So we've got the yellow perch, we've got the catfish, and then what's the other one we're learning about today? Bluegill. Bluegill. Yep. I assume that those have blue gills? Um, not exactly. Well, that's just confusing. <laughs> well, oh, there we go. So bluegill have a spot on their gills that's kind of blue in color. Oh, it's not the whole gill. Well, I assume when we uh, look at those pictures of fish, we'll get to see that. Yeah. You want to see my picture of the yellow perch? Sure. All right. Well, because it's called the yellow perch, I figured it was mostly yellow. But then since it likes the, uh, the, uh, the sunrise and the sunset, I kind of put the orange and the pink in there as well. Hmm, that's interesting. When, when we when we show the fit when we show the picture, you'll have to see how close you are. Sounds like a plan. Well, if, uh, again, if you're joining us today for our bear den meeting, we're doing a bear goes fishing, which I'm really excited about because it's uh, the first time I've gotten to get out uh, to do some fishing this year. And Peggy, why is this su such a great uh, activity for this particular time in our lives? Well, I I think that this is the perfect activity for social distancing. Because mm. do you know what the first thing you do when you get out and go fishing is? You make a bunch of noise, right? Well, you can, but that might scare the, some of the fish away. Oh, so it's kind of a quiet activity? It's a quiet activity. And the first thing you need to do is do a safety circle. Oh, yeah. So you want to make sure there's nobody close to you so you don't hook them. Exactly. And your fishing pole is like three feet long. Oh. So if you take right. a fishing pole and walk and make a really and put it out and make a circle, what have you just created? I've created my social distancing. It has to be what six feet. 
Yep, six feet. Well, look at that. Nobody within six feet. Perfect social distancing activity. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's nice and relaxing, too. Uh, uh -huh. My family always calls it drowning worms. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. We don't catch a lot of fish, but we have fun doing it. <laughs> well, Peggy, I think it's about time for us to get our, our den meeting started here. So okay. uh, we're going to do the pledge, the Scout Oath and the Scout Law. Uh, Peggy, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I'll do the pledge. So we're going to stand up. And Scout Salute. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, yeah. one nation under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, two. All right, I've got my scout signed up for the scout oath. Okay, why don't you take this one? All right, on my honor, I will do my best, my best. do my duty, to guide my God country. To obey the scout law, help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. And finally, the scout law, you want to lead us in that one? Oh boy. How about we do this one together? All right. Okay. A, A scout, scout is trustworthy, trustworthy loyal, loyal, helpful, helpful friendly, courteous, courteous no, kind, kind, obedient, obedient cheerful, cheerful, thrifty. Brave, brave, clean, clean and, and reverent. reverent. Oh, I'm getting rusty there. <laughs> <laughs> so our scouts at home, if you could tell us in the Facebook comments, which of those 12 points of the scout law you think most relate to fishing? We've already talked about it being a social distancing activity, a quiet activity. So think about those 12 points and, and write in the comments so uh, Anthony can tell us which are most important while we're fishing. That's a good question. I'm going to have to think about that one myself. <laughs> All right, Peggy. Well, I am so excited to learn about these three different types of fish. We've, we've introduced the yellow perch, the catfish, and the bluegill, and uh, I'd like to learn a little more about them. Okay, so let me... Oh, let me get... While we're getting that PowerPoint pulled up for everybody, again, if you look in the uh, description of this video, you'll find some helpful links for throughout our dead meeting today, including those uh, those coloring pages. There, you'll see some uh, resources on how to build your own fishing pole and some other stuff as well. Oh, looks like we're ready to get started. Looks like uh, as close as we're going to get. It doesn't want to let me do it. It doesn't okay. want to let me go full screen. There we go. Okay, so these are the requirements. This is all the stuff we're going to talk about today. Uh, discover and learn about three types of fish in our area, draw a colored picture of each fish, record what each one likes to eat, and describe what sort of habitat each one likes. Learn about your local fishing regulations with your den leader or a parent or guardian. Learn about fishing equipment and make a simple fishing pole. Practice casting at a target. And then go on a fishing adventure and spend a minimum of one hour trying to catch a fish. Put into practice the things you've learned about fish and fishing equipment. Now, to get this award, you only need to do three. You don't need to do all of them. You just need to do three. So let's look at some fish anatomy. So, oh, wow, there's a lot there. There is a lot there. So obviously, the fish has a mouth because that's where you want the hook to be, right? Mm -hmm. And then it has the eyes. And most fish have eyes on the side of their head. Do you know why fish have eyes on the side of their head? Well, they're pretty flat, so it'd be hard to have uh, eyes in the middle of their head. I guess they want to be able to see on both sides of them as they swim around? Yep. It allows them to see more predators that are swimming around. Mm. Now, the spiny dorsal fin, uh, when you're handling fish, you got to be careful. Because mm -hmm. a lot of them have a spiny dorsal fin, which could poke you. Uh, and then they have the soft dorsal fin and the caudal fin at the back. That's what gives them momentum as they swim. And then fish are covered in scales, which help protect them. And they have pectoral fins on their sides. And then, do you know how fish breathe? 
Well, it's not through the air because they're underwater. I think they have things called gills. How do those work? They do. Uh, it allows them to remove oxygen from the water that comes into their bodies. And they have a gill cover. So when you're fishing and you're handling the fish, you want to be very careful of the gill cover because we don't want to, if we, we don't want to damage the fish. We want to be as respectful to that fish as we can because mm -hmm. we're either we're either doing catch and release, which is when you catch the fish and then throw it back into the water so somebody else can catch it, mm -hmm. or you're going to catch the fish and you're going to eat it. But you want to be very respectful of the fish and you don't want to cause it more harm, more damage. You don't want to hurt it any more than you have to by what you're doing, whether you're eating it or whether you're throwing it back. So you want to be very careful of the gill cover. Is that you're... that thing that kind of opens and closes when I see it out, out, of, out of the water? Exactly. Exactly. And when you are holding a fish, if the fish's mouth is here, you want to go like this to tamp down that spiny dorsal fin and mm -hmm. to not get poked. But it also smooths down the pectoral fins and the pelvic fins because you don't want to damage the fins on a fish because if you damage the fins, what can't they do right? They can't swim right. They can't swim right. Okay. So you want to go from the front of the fish to the back to avoid those the uh, spiny dorsal fins. That's actually why I have my gloves today as well. You know, I'm going to talk about that later. Let's see if I can remember. So there's the spiny dorsal fin that's on the top. Yep. And then right behind it is the soft dorsal fin. Mm -hmm. I remember the pectoral fins, which are on the sides. And what was the one on the bottom of the back again? The pelvic fins. Pelvic fins. Okay, I got it. Okay, so because my PowerPoint doesn't want to load correctly, the answer is going to be given to this fish right to the fish right away. But here we have the yellow the yellow perch. I think it's the yellow perch, Peggy. Am I right? Yep, you're right. All right. <laughs> now you were right on some of your colors. Do you see how the pectoral fins are orange? I do. Yeah. The t but it's more of a greeny color, isn't it? Oh, you got some green in there, I think. Oh, it's a bright, bright yellow green. Bright yellow. Yeah. Well, we're close. Um, the yellow pit, the yellow perch is found all over North America, and it likes to eat insects, fish eggs, baby fish, and it likes to live along the shore. Uh, it, it likes to have places to hide. Mm, okay. Now. What color is this fish's belly? Mm, looks pretty white to me. Yep, and what color is its top? Mm, it's very dark green. Mm -hmm. This is a type of camouflage. It's called Why counter that? shading. And guess what this helps the fish do? Uh, I mean, you said it likes to hide, but how do the colors help it? It helps it hide from predators because there's birds that love to eat perch and they'll fly over top and the top is kind of green and muted colors. Oh yeah. So what do you think a bird floating over, flying over the top is gonna to look down and see? It's just gonna see that dark green, it's gonna blend in. It's gonna blend in and they're gonna go, nope, no fish for me today. And then other fish will like to eat it and, other, and the fish will swim under it and they'll look up and they'll see the white belly. And what do they think that white belly is? The sky? The sky. So counter shading helps an animal hide a little bit better. Interesting. Okay. Now, ready for the next fish? Well, Anthony, do we have anybody joining us? Any uh, answers on our fishing uh, through the scout law? Fishing through the scout law, Jared. Hello, everybody. We have um, clean uh, times two. People say ah, nice. fish like to be, you know, clean. And then uh, we also have um, somebody, uh, one of our viewers is coming in from Peru. So welcome. Oh, hello. And Thanks for joining us. And then uh, we also have, um, let's see, who's joining us here? Owen is here. And Tommy Hi, is here. Hi, Tommy. And uh, Owen says the fins help the fish. In many different ways, uh, back when Peggy was explaining uh, how uh, how the fins uh, help the fish out in the PowerPoint. That's right. It looks like each each one of those fins uh, has its own separate kind of uh, duty. Yeah, each one has a separate job. And what do you think? 
the uh, going to go back that spiny dorsal fin. What do you think one of its jobs is? Well, it's uh, keeping me from from picking it up really easily for one. Maybe it's it for, for defense. It. Yeah, it helps protect it. Okay, you ready for the next fish? I am. Okay, this is a fish that lots of people like to eat. That's a funny looking one. It is, isn't it? And it gets its name for those whiskers on the front of its face. Ah, so the people at home, you can probably see it on the screen, but this one is, the whiskers must mean it's a catfish. It is a channel catfish. A lot of people will call them channel cats. And they live in the ponds, lakes, and streams, and they have a very good sense of smell and a very good, sen and a very good sense of taste. These fish like to live on the very bottoms of the lakes and the streams, and they, and they, like, they, they like the mud and the grungy stuff because that's where they find a lot of their food. They're an omnivore. They'll eat almost anything. In fact, I've seen them eat Rice Krispie treats. Oh, that can't be part of the diet. <laughs> no, but the catfish at Firelands really like Rice Krispie treats. <laughs> I'm sure they do. Who doesn't? <laughs> and there's even been reports of these fish eating ivory soap. Wow, what do they eat normally? Crickets and night crawlers and minnows and pretty much anything they can get in their mouth because they're omnivores. Yeah, anything they can find on the bottom of the uh, bottom, bottom of the pond there, huh? Yep. Very cool. These, this one's all one color, so uh, my yellow perch is nowhere clear, nowhere close to that one. I just need a blue blue marker for that one. No, nope. and if you notice, um, ch uh, channel catfish, they have a mm -hmm. tendency to be very dark, muddy colors, which tells a lot about where they like to live, huh? I guess so. That's true. Okay, you ready for the last fish? Let's do it. Okay. This is a bluegill, a bluegill sunfish. And a lot of times they're just called bluegill, although sometimes they're called sunfish. You know, I always thought those are two different kinds of fish, but they're the same thing. Uh, I'll be honest, I thought they were two. <laughs> but, Interesting, so bluegill sunfish. Yep. All right. Now, notice the dot behind its gills, or on the gill cover. There's the bluegill. The in its body. Mm -hmm. Now, this one likes to hide inside old tree stumps and underwater structures. And so he likes to hide too, kind of like the sun, kind of like the, the uh, yellow perch. Yep. And this one is actually really important in the food web because there's a lot of things that like to eat it. Like what? Well, like everything. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, it's got to do some good hiding then, huh? Yeah, it has to be really good at hiding. This poor fish. Everything likes to eat it. Even humans. What does uh, it like to eat? It likes to eat little things like insect larvae, leeches, snails, that sort of thing. Interesting. So, so we've got a catfish that's an omnivore. We like this one that likes the insects. And our yellow perch, uh, which one did that like to eat? That one liked to eat insects, fish eggs, and juvenile fish. Okay, so it could, uh, it could go for a little bit bigger things. Yep. And the coloring can also tell you a little bit about where the fish lives in the, in the pond because fish like certain temperatures. Okay. So a colder fish will live on the bottom, and that's kind of a muddy brown color, right? Mm hmm And the yellow perch, are they going to find a lot of insects underwater? Probably not. No. So they live closer to the top, which is why you have the counter shading. But then we have the bluegill. They like to live inside old tree stumps and mm -hmm. at the very edges of the pond where it's usually dark and has a lot of what colors? Uh, probably lots of browns and greens. Yep, browns and dark greens, colors like that. So that's why, that's why the fish are colored the way they're colored, so that they can hide better. And it also tells you a little bit about where they live in terms of how deep they are in the water. Very interesting. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll throw that question back to our, our viewers. Which of the fish was the fish that likes to live on the very deepest part of the pond? And which fish was the one that liked to live up closer towards the top? 
We'll uh, wait for those answers to come in. And while we're doing that, I think we're going to move into different kinds of fishing equipment now that we know which fish we're looking for. Yep. So what do you think I have in my tackle box? Actually, guess what a tackle box is? Uh, what you hold your fishing things in. Yep, because the equipment for fishing is called tackle. Oh, okay. New vocabulary word. Very good. So let's see. I have pliers, mm -hmm. needle nose pliers. Guess what I use these for? To get the hook out. To get the hook out. Very good. And are those scissors? These are scissors, a very small pair of scissors. Because sometimes you just have to cut the line. Because mm -hmm. if the fish okay. swallows the hook, mm -hmm. Don't bother pulling it out. Just cut the line and put the fish back in. Most times the uh, hook itself will eventually rust it's away. But if you if you try yanking and try pulling it out, you're actually causing a lot of pain and damage to the fish. Hmm. And it, it doesn't and the fish doesn't survive. And okay. we want to be respectful of the fish that we catch. So that's what the scissors for. Let's see. Oh, it looks like uh, we have some more comments in our uh, Facebook feed. Well, we do <laughs> have, um, Jared, back to your question about what fish lives at the bottom of the uh, of, the of, of the lake or, yeah, whatever, yeah, exactly. Pond is the word I'm looking for. Um, I believe we do have the correct answer here, um, and mm -hmm. that would be the catfish. Mm -hmm. That is correct. He likes to live in the mud on the bottom. Awesome. Yes, and that came from Owen. Great job, Owen. What else is, uh, we can also ask uh, our, our folks what they have in their tackle boxes while uh, Miss Peggy pulls out the rest of the fur tackle. Okay. This is sinkers. So what do you think worms do in water? Mm, well, they're really lightweight, so they're going to float. They're going to float. You need something to keep your hook underwater. And so you use sinkers. And you put sinkers on your line. So you just add weight to your fishing line? You add weight to your fishing line, but you usually don't add it right at the hook. Okay. You, you, you usually add it a couple inches above. So the sinker sinks here and your hook will float up and it'll look like a natural thing swimming in the water. If you put it right on the bottom, that hook doesn't wiggle and the fish don't get interested. Ah, the wiggle is the good part. Yep, the wiggle is the good part. All right, so we've talked about uh, our pliers, our scissors, and our sinkers. What's next? A fishing glove. Gloves. This, this is actually, it has a textured side to it, mm -hmm. and, and then a non-textured side. I always use gloves to handle fish. Why is that? Well, number one, I don't want to get actually accidentally stuck by that fin, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. But then two, I don't want to make fish sick. Okay. They have slime on their bodies uh -huh. and our hands will take that slime off and bacteria that we have on our hands, we then give to the fish. Oh, so we're not even as concerned about getting, uh, getting stuff from the fish. We don't want to make the fish sick. We don't want to make the fish sick. It's easier on the fish to use the glove, so I always use a glove. Then, Good deal. What's next? The bobber. Hey, I got one of those. Yeah, you got one of those. What does it do when you throw it in the water? Well, it uh, one points out points out to me where my line is, so I can keep an eye on it. But it also floats on top of the water there. Yep. And then the, if a fish were to grab onto your hook and start to go away, what does the bobber do? It goes under. It goes under. So it lets us know when the uh, when there's a bite on your hook. And then I Very have, important. what do you think this is? I don't know, but it looks interesting. Let's see. So if I were to put in the water, what it would do, it would kind of look like a really frilly fish. And then this would reflect the sun, right? Oh, is that going to catch the fish's attention? That's going to catch the fish's attention. Sometimes if you don't want to use a worm, you can uh -huh. use something like this 
Uh -huh. And it'll attract the fish. And what's that called? You know, I knew the answer two minutes ago. I think it's a lure, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. It's a lure. <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, and Peggy. So they, yes. And that, and the, and the shiny thing on the end tends to spin when you're reeling in to really catch the fish's attention to allow the sunlight to, uh, to capture that as well. Sorry to cut you off there, Jared. Exactly. Uh, it's my attention too. It this has a swivel on it that turns around, so this just flips. And for this, you don't use a bobber because if you're fishing with the lure, you're casting and then you're reeling it back in and you're casting and you're reeling it back in and you're casting mm. and you're reeling over and over until a fish goes, hmm, that looks interesting. Also, okay. uh, let's uh, let's ask our, our live viewers who's on Team Worm and who's on Team Lure. I know I'm personally on Team Worm because I think they're kind of cool. I like using worms more than uh, lures. I'm going to disagree with both of you, and I like oh. a good lure. Team lure. You like lures? I do. What do you like about the lures? Um, one, Miss Peggy and, and Mr. Jared, I don't like mm -hmm. to get uh, the worm guts on me. That's just me. Yeah. And I don't mind using the minnows, but definitely uh, the, the lure I just have better luck with. So when you use minnows, do you hook them through the eyes or the tail? I hook them through the eyes. That, I've heard I that's how I've always done it, but some people say that the tail works better. Nope. I've always hooked them through the eyes because then it looks like a real fish swimming, swimming. as they're going. Exactly. That's how what I do. All right, sorry to interrupt. Okay. No, that's great. So uh, we've uh, we've got our tackle here. What's next, Peggy? Um, I also have these are to catch catfish. So you can get some things that have that are scented to attract more fish so if you don't like to use a worm because of worm guts uh -huh. but the lures aren't working you can get things like this which are scented to attract fish i know you said earlier that the catfish have a really good sense of smells yep so i have catfish dough here and that has a really good smell that'll attract the catfish now mm -hmm. When my father was a kid, you know what he used to use to catch catfish? No, what? Dough balls. What are dough balls? Well, that's when you go to the uh, kitchen and you grab the loaf of really squishy white bread. Oh, and squish it together into a ball? Squish it into a little bitty ball and you put it on your hook. Well, there you go. Yeah, my grandmother did not appreciate that very much. Because, <laughs> you know, that was lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay are you ready to learn a knot yes i love knots. <laughs> okay so let me share my screen again and if you're following along at home and want to look at this knot afterwards there's another link in uh, our description to show this knot what are we learning which one okay we are going to learn a brand new knot called the palomar knot okay so what's this used for this is used for uh, putting your hook on the line. It, it's, a, it's a fishing knot. It's one that you would use on your fishing line. And to teach it to everybody, I use a paper clip. So here we go. I use a paper clip, but that uh -huh. doesn't look like a fishing hook, does it? No, not quite. However, oh, that's closer. What does that look like now? Now we've got a pointy end and we've got a hole to put the line through. Yeah. I'm going to move this back up. Perfect. Okay. So now you have your string. Mm -hmm. And to practice it, you can use. There we go. To practice it, you can use yarn or string, anything around the house with mm -hmm. your parents' permission. Of course. So on a hook, here's a hook. This long part here is called the shank. The shank, okay. 
and this is the eye. Because it looks like an eye. Exactly. And then this is the barb right there. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take the end of your line and you're going to put it through the eye. Easy. And then you're going to put the end back through. Would you wrap it around first or just, uh, just put it through twice? Just put it through twice. So you okay. have a loop just like this. Got it. Okay. Now, on one end, and, uh, the end of the, the string on the other. So you know how to do an overhand knot, right? Of course. It's the very first knot we learned. Yep. We taught that a couple weeks ago for our Cub Scout lesson. So you do an overhand knot with the loop. See the loop right here? I do, yep. So you're using the, tricky the, part. the loop to tie the knot. Got it. Here's the tricky part. Uh huh. Put the hook through the loop. Well, that wasn't even that tricky at all. And then you tighten it up. And that's it? That's it. Oh my gosh, Peggy, that was so easy. I've been tying my hooks on my line wrong my entire life. So a lot of people will use a square knot to tie stuff onto your fishing line. Do you know okay. what happens with a square knot? Mm, well, it might be kind of hard to tie that with the, with the fishing line. Well, it comes undone, and then when you go to cast, everything keeps going. Oh and no, you, you lose your hook? And you lose your hook, you lose it all. Okay, so we're gonna do this one more time. Okay. So everybody can follow along. I think you the put the, uh, the end through the eye. It, actually, why don't you tell me what to do? Okay, so if I remember, you put the end through the eye, mm -hmm. and then you kind of pull it through a little bit and then put it back through the way it came in. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And now we're gonna use the loop that we just made, and we're gonna tie an overhand knot with that. Before you tighten it, you're going to use that loop end and put it around the bottom of the hook. So it kind of snugs it up like it's giving it a hug, and then you can pull it from the top so it tightens itself down. Yep. Well, that is one that I will not forget. <laughs> and it slides a little bit better when you're, when you're using fishing line. String doesn't slide as well as fishing line. But... You can't see fishing line on the computers really well. <laughs> no, it's going to okay. be sneaky for the fish. Now, yes. that's what else you need to do before you can go fishing. Well, I've got to make sure I've got my sinker and my bobber on, and I want to make sure I know how to cast. What are we doing next? we got to put a fish on the hook. A fish on the hook? Or, or not fish, a worm. we got to put a worm on the hook so... Th Sorry. The fish are calling. They say, don't catch me. Yeah, they're, they're saying, don't catch me. So we have to put something on this hook that's going to make the fish come get, come get it. Now, uh, I'm not going to use a real worm today because okay. this is to practice. And this is a way you guys can practice at home. Guess what that is? Well, that looks delicious. That would uh, make me want to bite it. Yep, that is a gummy worm. It's awesome. Perfect. That's a great idea. It is perfect for catching tigers, wolves, bears, even some weeblows. <laughs> and it looks to be the right size for your paperclip paper clip practice hook. Exactly. So when you're putting a worm on the hook, the more mm -hmm. times that hook goes through the worm's body, the better that worm is going to stay on the hook. So mm -hmm. you kind of poke it through. And you want to ultimately hide as much of that hook as possible mm -hmm. with that gummy yeah. worm. Got to be sneaky. Got to be sneaky. So, so it looks pretty simple. It looks like you're just uh, poking it through the worm, sliding it up, poking it through the worm and sliding it up. And now I can hardly even see the hook. Exactly. And if I were, if, if I were going to go fishing for bears, I would then take this out in the woods and throw it and wait for a bear to bite. <laughs> Good plan. Okay, so let's talk about hooks for a moment. 
Okay. So this is the point on the hook, right? Yep. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. And this is a bar. Careful. So there's, there's a lot of fishing hooks out there that have really big barbs on them. Make sure your worm doesn't come off and the fish doesn't come off. That's part of the reason. But guess what that barb also does? Mm, I don't know. What does it do? It keeps the fish from coming off. And if I was going to catch that fish to eat it, that might be a good thing. But if I don't want to put the fish back, maybe not. Exactly. Because you can see the lure has a little bit bigger of a barb. Because when mm -hmm. something bites onto here, it'll poke it and it won't come off. Mm -hmm. So, when you're going to fish for catch and release, or if you're fishing at Firelands or Beaumont, mm -hmm. guess what you need to do? Make sure that my hook does not have a barb, because I want to be able to put the fish back. Exactly. But you know, it's sometimes hard to find barbless fish hooks. Yeah, I found that. Yes, it is difficult to find it. But if I take my pair of pliers straight from your tackle box, straight from the tackle box, I can usually press it down. Then you can make your own barbell soaker. Now, that's pushed down a little bit. I'm not sure if you can tell, but it's been pushed down. Another thing you can buy is circle hooks. Circle I've hooks. Seen a circle hook. Yep. A circle hook is has more of a circle shape to it and no barb. So it's shaped more like this versus a traditional hook. Mm -hmm. So when the fish gets caught on this one, it bites and it twirls. So it catches the fish and it's more likely that the fish is going to get caught in the corner of its mouth and less okay. likely the fish is going to swallow the hook. Well, that makes sense. I'll also give that a try. Yeah, they're, they're a really good thing to use. Okay, so let's Seems see what like we We've talked about fish, uh -huh. and we've talked about equipment. I know what we still need to talk about. What's that? The rules. Mm, yes, can't go fishing about uh, knowing what kind of rules are in place out there. Because the, the rules are important, right? It sure is. So, well, let's ask, let's ask Facebook. Uh, can anybody think of any fishing rules that are out there? Any fishing rules that you know of? And uh, while you're answering that, can we check in with Anthony and see uh, who's on Team Worm and who's on Team Lure? All right. Hello, Jared and Peggy. We have Team Worm. We have two people for Worm, and so far I'm the only one for the Lure. Only team one Worm for the win. win. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm partial to worms. No, I disagree, <laughs> Peg. They're gummy flavored. <laughs> okay. So, so, fishing regulations. Fishing regulations. Uh, one of them is if you're over 16, you have to buy a fishing license. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, a hunting license. Just like a hunting license. And do you know why those are important? Uh, because you want to make sure that you're not uh, taking too many fish out from the area that you're fishing, right? Well, those are for, well, there are fishing limits where during mm -hmm. certain times of the year you can only catch so many fish, or there's some fish that you're not allowed to keep during certain times of the year. But the fishing license actually doesn't have a lot, it is, d doesn't have a lot to do with how many fish you catch. Oh, what's it for? Well, do you know where the money from fishing licenses and hunting licenses too. Do you know where that money goes? Uh, it goes back to the Department of Natural Resources, right? Yeah, in Ohio, it goes to ODNR, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And do mm -hmm. you know what they use that money for? Probably do uh, make sure that the, uh, the natural areas stay safe and stay, stay uh, good for all the visitors. So the ODNR money goes for education, 
It goes for rehabilitation of areas that need to be cleaned up. And it also has grant money that it goes to. And the grant money can be used to help get more people out camping and fishing and hunting. So by being a fisher person that buys a license, you're helping lots of different programs that the ODNR puts on to uh, yep. make sure that fishing stays great for everybody. Exactly. And then there are fishing limits out there where there's only certain numbers of fish you can catch at different times. Do you know why those are important? Because uh, you don't want to take too many and then remove them from their natural habitat forever. Yep. And not only that, like during spawning season, there's certain fish you can catch and certain fish you can't catch, especially if a species is in trouble. Do you know that some of the biggest people who are into conservation, do you know what they like to do? I don't know what. They like to hunt and fish. Makes sense. And, and they'll buy the, the licenses, and they, they know that if they want their hobby to continue, they better take care of it, which means cleaning up waterways and not leaving our, and what's, the, what's that phrase? Trashing your trash? Leave no, no trace? Mm -hmm. Which brings me to your worms. When you're yes. done fishing, what do you do with your worms? Mm, I feed them to my turtle. Well, okay, you feed them to your turtle. And Anthony uses lures, so I know he's not going to have leftover fish or leftover worms. But when you're done with your – hey, actually, you have a thing of worms there. Could you hold it up so everybody could read it? I do. Canadian night crawlers. Canadian night crawlers. So do you think those worms belong – around here no they came from Canada <laughs> <laughs> now worms actually do not belong in this area they, they've they're, they're normal in our area now and worms are actually very very useful but night crawlers aren't actually native to our area do you know why worms are important besides catching fish because they help the ecosystem they do what do they do uh, they break down things in the soil so that the uh, plants and animals can use them the way they're supposed to Exactly. So when you're done with your worms, you want to throw them away. You don't want to dump them on the ground. Okay, so we're going to watch you put a worm on your hook, right? We are. So uh, we're going to do some, uh, some demonstration of uh, how to cast down to a pond. Now, if you are at home and uh, you don't have a fishing pole of your own yet, you can certainly make one of your own by using just a stick or a dowel that you might have in your garage and some line. You could practice using yarn or something uh, like Ms. Peggy did today. Or if you have fishing line, you can actually put fishing line onto the end of your pole and keep wrapping it around and around and around and attach it to the end of your pole. And with those two things, plus a hook using the Palomar knot that we learned today, uh, you can create your own fishing pole at home so you can practice casting. And you can even use it to catch fish in a real pond. Mm -hmm. okay. In our video uh, description here, you'll find a link for some instructions on how to build your own pole at home, as well as a video, if you'd like to see it uh, visually, on how to build the pole for less than a dollar. So I'm uh, using your technique here, uh, Miss Peggy, on putting the worm through the hook and sliding it up and trying to hide as much as possible. And it also helps hold the worm on the hook. Uh, by Absolutely. looping it a lot, especially once you've tamped down that barb. Gotcha. So you have your worm. Do you have any? Do you have a sinker on your on your line? I do not have a sinker on this line, unfortunately, but I do a bobber. Okay, and the bobber is what about a foot and a half up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, for most fish, you don't need to have you don't need to have like three feet of line, and you, you just need to have about. If, foot, foot and a half, bobber to, to worm, mm -hmm. and people love to not use a bobber. They, I find the bobber to be very helpful. Well, there's a lot of people that think only little kids use a bobber. Well, and that's not true. That's not true at all. I like to use a bobber because what the bobber does is it also helps keep your worm above all of the 
grass and sticks and everything else on the bottom of the pond that your worm could get held up on. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason I like to use a bobber. Very good. Now there are two last things that uh, we want to share before we go down to the pond and, uh, and actually start our fishing activity here. And the first one is uh, talking about the best kind of reel that we have, right? So what yes. I've got here is one with a button on it. What's this one called, Miss Peggy? That one is, I really like those. That one is a, oh, where'd you go? I've lost you. <laughs> that one is a spin cast reel. And uh -huh. I have one here as well. And my computer is doing something weird. Is uh, this one, is this a spin caster, the kind that you'd recommend for our Bear Scouts? Yes, I do. I like this one. When you press the button, mm -hmm. you got to hold the button down because when you release it, it releases your line. Yep. I like using these simply because. I've never had a problem with them getting tangled. I've never had a problem with them like spewing line everywhere. I really like mm -hmm. these, but there's others. And when you, I have a really nice one and this is a spinning reel. Ooh, fancy. Yeah, this one is fancy. And this one has, it's called a bale this thing here that you flip over and it releases the line and then you close it in the reel back up when well, when you uh, move your handle here it flips back over one of the drawbacks to this because everything is open it will sometimes do some people call it a bird's nest other people call it a rat's nest it will sometimes get all sorts of knots all in here. And it is a pain to get those knots out. An absolute pain. Now, one of the nice things about this rod, uh, the, the spinning versus yours, is mm -hmm. I can actually switch the side that my handle is on. I'm left-handed, so I moved the handle the left side so I can reel in with my left hand. But if I wanted to, I could unscrew this and switch it over to the other side. And for the type you have, that isn't all that usually isn't the case because it's a different because of how it's built. Okay. All right, well I'm down at my fishing area. It looks very muddy down there, so I'm hopeful that there's some catfish in there. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Peggy, can you uh, kind of talk me through how I should uh, start my cast? Well, first, did you do your safety circle? Safety circle. So I'm going to spin around, take a look, make sure there's nobody in the area that I'm going to hook. We are clear. Okay. So, yeah, it's not just for social distancing. We This also way, it's less likely we're going to hook somebody. Cool. So to use one of those, you're going to put your, you're going to put your thumb on the button. You're going to hold it down. Pushing down the button. Now, with your shoulder being the middle of a clock, I want you to think of a clock right over here. Okay. Okay. So could you show me where nine o'clock would be on your clock? So nine o'clock would be straight out in front of me, right? Perfect. So you're going to take your arm and you're going to go back to about one o'clock. Okay, so 11, 12, 1. Yep. You did not, you don't need to go any further back than that. Everybody loves doing it, but you're not going to get any more power. It's all in the wrist. You're going to hold okay. that button down and you're going to start going forward. And when your line is at about 11 o'clock, then you release the button. All right. So when I go forward, I'm going to go to 12 and then one, I'm going to release when I get back to here, right? Yep. All right. A well, little, bit, try little bit sooner. <clears throat> all right. Okay. So I'm at 11 and I yeah. go to one and let go of the button. Plop. Plop. I don't know if you can see that out there, but it went out probably uh, 20 feet out into the pond here. That was awesome. Now, one of the things you're going to want to do before you go is practice. Mm -hmm. And you could do that by taking your rod and your reel and putting a big weight. There's really big sinkers, so you could get a big sinker to put on the bottom of it. 
or you could set everything up and get a big marshmallow and put the marshmallow over your hook. Mm -hmm. The important thing is you don't want to hurt anybody when you're practicing. Sure. And so then, if I'm doing this inside my house, I can uh, I can use that marshmallow for safety and for a little bit of weight. You should probably not do it inside your house. Okay. <clears throat> Moms and dads get very irritated when their kids decide to go fishing in the house, especially if they're fishing in the goldfish bowl. <laughs> All right, so I've cast it out into the pond, and then yep. uh, I have... Now, uh, turn your handle until it clicks. Got it. Has it clicked? It, it clicked. clicked. Yay! What that does is it stops the line from going out any further. And now we wait. Perfect. Now we wait. We wait. All right, so there's my, my bobber out there. I don't get to just reel it back in? No, not unless you're, you're using a lure. If you're using a lure, You'd be throwing it and you'd reel it back in and throw it and reel it back in. But what we're going to do is you just let it sit there and the worm bobs along and the fish eventually goes, hmm, that looks tasty. And so it'll grab it and your bobber will go underwater. Interesting. So I got to watch that bobber really carefully. You got to watch the bobber real, real carefully. All right. Well, I want to practice my cast one more time. Okay. I know that uh, one thing that uh, people who like to fish love to do is talk about how big a fish that they've caught. So uh, while we're practicing, while we're casting here and uh, being patient with our bobber, I'd love to hear from our Facebook friends watching with us how big of a fish they've ever caught before. Now, my, my dad used to go fishing, and every once in a while he'd go walleye fishing. And walleye is a great fish to eat. And he comes back one day and he told us he caught a walleye. Okay. So I take that back. I was fishing with him that day and he caught a walleye. Okay. Oh, a little guy. A little guy. We could have taken it home and put it in a fishbowl. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so why don't we, the one thing we forgot to talk about entirely is what to do if you do get poked by a fish hook. Because that happens. Sure. Do you, do you pull it right back out? Mm, depends on if it has a barb or not. Exactly. Exactly. So it depends on if it has a barb. And should you panic? No, of course not. Should, should you go start going, ah! I think I would uh, want to tell the adult that I'm fishing with. Tell the adult you're fishing with. Most times they can get it out really easily on... Um, Sometimes they got to do other things, but tell an adult as soon as possible and then make sure you wash it out really well because it's going to have all sorts of germs on it. I know that I've cut myself and I don't know how many times fishing and, you know, gotten the hook in my hand and maybe I shouldn't go fishing. <laughs> it just takes more practice. It does take practice, but I have a lot of fun doing it. It's a really nice way to spend an afternoon. Well, while we're waiting for those fishing stories to come in, I think the last thing we have for our den meeting here is uh, just reviewing some of those points in the scout law and, and how they relate to fishing. So we've talked a little about being clean and want to be clean with the, our fish so that we don't give them germs. But we also want to be courteous, of course, so we're not allowed when we're uh, uh, around other people who are fishing. Mm -hmm. We also want to be courteous in the place where we're fishing and uh, pick up our trash after us. Yep. We talked about the rules and the re regulations of fishing and getting a license if you're fishing in a public pond. Uh, so that is being obedient. Yeah. And uh, can you think of one more? Well, I like, I, I think respectful is important when you're fishing because you need mm -hmm. to show respect for that fish. Yeah, I know that sounds kind of right? silly, doesn't it? Just to be respectful to a fish. No, I think it's great. We always want to be kind to other creatures. Mm -hmm. awesome. Even if you're taking it home and eating it, you still want to be respectful. Fantastic. Well, Anthony, do we have any uh, any great fisher people out there? We do not, unfortunately, at this time, uh, Jared. Well, I'll tell you about the biggest fish I ever caught. And it was actually one that was at Firelands. I told you about those big catfish before, right? Yeah. Well, I had been fishing at, at Firelands for three years without catching anything watching all of our scouts at summer camp pull out these giant fish. 
fish after fish out of fish. And I never had any luck until earlier this fall, I finally caught one of those giant catfish I had my eye on for three years. So that, uh, that was pretty exciting and I'm hoping to be able to get back out there and do it again soon. Wow. Last spring when I was out at Firelands, I saw a kid almost catch one of those really big catfish. Do you know what happened? Did it uh, break his line too big? It broke his line. I'm telling you, they're monsters. He almost had it to the bank, no less. Oh, <laughs> it was so disappointing. It was tragic. It was just tragic. All right, Peggy. Well, we're coming up on the end of our hour here together. I want to say thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and uh, putting this together for us and showing us your tackle box and everything that you uh, were able to share today. And I also want to thank all of our bears who followed along with us. <clears throat> for, uh, I, I, I had fun doing it. I'm very thankful that you let me do it. <laughs> Anytime. And uh, if you enjoy Peggy's lessons, you can come visit her this summer at the Firelands, where she's going to be working in our shooting sports area. But I'm sure she's going to be doing some fishing out there this summer, too. Here's hoping. You know, <laughs> I, I keep bringing my equipment and never having time. This is my nope. fourth year's camp staff, and I've put my line in the water twice. We'll have to make some time for you this summer. <laughs> If uh, you followed along at home and you uh, did all the activities with us, and then you, uh, if you're doing number four, you spend an hour outside practicing those skills, you'll be able to check off all four of those requirements for a bear ghost fishing. Remember, you only have to do three of them, so you can pick the three that make the most sense for you. And when you get back together with your den leader, you can let them know that you completed that adventure. Do you have any last comments from our viewers, Anthony? Just got a lot of thank yous from our viewers, and uh, they really appreciate you guys. Well, awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Yeah. Hope you guys all stay safe. Uh, if you want to check out our camper all this weekend, that starts on Saturday. You can find more information on our website. Oh, looks like I'm starting to get a bite. Oh, I don't know if you can see that, but there goes my bobber. So I'm going to say goodbye and see if I can reel one in. Okay. Post a picture, Jared. You can bye, Jared. <laughs> see you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.